After Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel, Israeli officials were quick to promise a robust response. The Israeli war cabinet is said to favor hitting back, but divided over when and how they are going to do that. What are Israel's options? How will Israel retaliate now against Iran? Will US get dragged into a regional war over its ironclad support for Israel? For more on this, we're being joined by Dr. Malcolm Davis, who's a senior analyst in defense strategy and capability at Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He's joining us from Canberra. So welcome to Weon. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Israel is keen to hit back. What are Israel's options? Look, I think that, as you say, the United States uh, is trying to dissuade Israel from striking back. But I think it's it's uh, unbelievable that the Israelis won't strike back. So it's a question of what they do. Uh, I think that uh, they would like to attack uh, Iran's uh, nuclear facilities to retard Iran's ability to get nuclear weapons in the short term. The suggestions are that the Iranians have enough fissile material for up to three nuclear weapons, but may take six months to actually create the weapons. Mm -hmm. So Israel would want to attack hardened and deeply buried targets in Fordo and Natanz mm -hmm. uh, to uh, essentially neutralize that threat. Second option would be to attack the manufacturing centers for ballistic missiles and drones uh, to reduce that threat. And the third option, I think, would be to attack uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Council command and control networks to actually reduce the effectiveness of future attacks on Israel. Uh, Mr. Davis, going by Israeli war tactics that we've seen so far, Israel always sort of resolves to a far stronger response than the attack they suffer as a means of deterrence, perhaps. But Iran has already warned that any Israeli response now will draw an even stronger Iranian counter. So they're both kind of applying the same strategy in terms of deterrence and counter. In this case, should Israel consider the matter as concluded, just as Iran mentioned, for the sake of the entire region? Because we have to remind all our viewers about this as well. This is not Hamas. This is the nation backing Hamas. So if they try to apply that kind of a tactic against Iran, Iran is going to come back, and not just alone, with, along with all its proxies, which are anyways targeting Israel. Should Israel sit this one out now? Well, the risk is that if they sit this one out, uh, then effectively the Netanyahu government essentially has not responded to a massive attack on Israel from Iran. Uh, that could encourage hardliners inside Iran to try their chances again in different ways. Uh, and also, this war is going on in Gaza. There's no sign of it ending. Uh, and the potential is that Iran could exploit those proxies anyhow to attack Israel in the future. And if Israel seemed to be doing nothing in response to this attack and then Iran goes on to attack Israel again through its proxies, the pressure will be uh, on the Netanyahu government to attack will be even greater. And so I think that um, it's a damned if they do, damned if they don't mm -hmm. scenario for Israel. There's there's a no win situation here. I just wanted to, you know, uh, delve a little deeper into what you mentioned that if Israel does not respond here, is this a response that Israel needs to give now? Because what Iran did was in response to what Israel did to Iran earlier. So is it not one for both? And now we call it a truce there and then for, I know things are not that simple, but now responding to an uh, attack, which was anyways in response to an Israeli attack, which started this between the two nations directly. Do you see it that way that it, given that circumstance, Israel needs to perhaps rethink this strategy? Well, look, that's, that's certainly the perception that I think uh, it, we see from the outside. Mm. But from the perspective of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, they see Iran as dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Uh, though the attack on uh, the consulate in Damascus, they the Israelis would argue was an attack on a military facility because the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Council, mm -hmm. um, were using that facility to plan attacks on Israel. Mm -hmm. So I think that whilst we may see it uh, in terms of um, Iran took a hit, Israel took a hit, let's leave it at that. Uh, from the Israeli perspective, mm -hmm. they are seeing it very differently and they see Iran as having escalated the conflict and so therefore Israel has to respond. I don't believe that Israel will simply choose not to respond. Uh, well, that's definitely a sentiment which is being widely shared because if we've seen anything 
from the Israeli side till now, they do not listen to the U.S. They do not listen to even the president's warnings. And even now, President Joe Biden warned Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. will not take part in a counteroffensive against Iran. Is this Iran-Israel direct conflict going to test U.S. ironclad commitment towards Israel? Look, I don't think it will test the defensive uh, commitment. I think that, you know, the US demonstrated that the other night where it actually supported um, the integrated air and missile defense of Israel against that Iranian attack. So future Iranian attacks of the same nature would be obviously um, would obviously be uh, defended against not only by Israel, but I think US forces in the region as well as uh, other US allies. Where it may be tested uh, will be in Israeli offensive actions against Iran. I think the Biden administration is desperate to to avoid being sucked into a wider war, in particular because this is an election year mm. and uh, Biden cannot afford to be seen to be dragging America into yet another endless Middle East conflict. So I do think that um, Biden will strongly pressure Netanyahu not to strike at I Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, Netanyahu is likely to ignore that for his own political reasons. Uh, and then the question is, how does the US manage the differentiation between supporting Israel in defensive terms versus not supporting Israel offensively? Uh, just wanted to also get your thoughts on this. Now, given the distance between Israel and Iran, there are portions of Saudi Arabia. There is no way that the nations in the middle don't get affected or involved if the two nations continue with the hostilities against each other. Now, there is, of course, uh, you know, there is Iraq in the middle, Syria, there is Jordan, there is Saudi Arabia, there is Iran on one side and Israel on one side, and of course, Lebanon, which is right there. All these nations, do you feel, will get involved in some way or the other, making it even tougher for other, glo other global powers to kind of call any kind of diplomatic talks in the middle? Well, I mean, I think that Iranian proxies in Iraq and Syria are already involved. Yes, Hezbollah played a limited supporting role in the operations the other day, mm. uh, uh, firing rockets from southern Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, future uh, exchanges of fire between Iran and Israel could see Hezbollah playing a much larger role, and potentially that would be really challenging for the Israeli integrated air and missile defense system to manage. Um, as for other states, Jordan played a role in shooting down incoming Iranian missiles. Yes. The Saudis, I think, also um, were in, in part uh, involved in terms of countering drones being for, uh, launched by the Houthis. So already this is, uh, to a degree, a multi-state conflict. Yes. The question is, how far does that go? How intense does it become? Uh, and uh, does it spiral out of control? Just one last uh, question, Mr. Davis. Given US support for Israel, which everyone understands is ironclad, and they've said it in as many words, do you feel you, uh, Russia and China are the only ones at the moment who can reign in Iran at the moment, given the fact that both nations have good ties there? Russia more well, than I think I think Russia doesn't want to reign in Iran. Um, this is very convenient for Moscow to have the U.S. diverted mm. into the Middle East, particularly at a critical time in Ukraine where Russia is starting to gain the advantage. So I think you should forget about Putin trying to play peacemaker here. As for China, um, I think, you know, once again, they have an interest in seeing uh, the United States in particular um, humiliated and embarrassed in the Middle East. Mm. Um, so whilst they don't want a full-scale war in the Middle East that could then uh, undermine their economy through uh, driving up oil prices, um, I don't think that they would be doing any the US any favours either. And I think it's important to note that there's increasing consensus amongst the strategic policy community that uh, conflicts in the Middle East, conflicts in Ukraine, mm -hmm tension in the South China Sea and uh, between the Taiwan Straits mm. are all part of a consistent and coordinated uh, campaign by authoritarian states to challenge Western liberal democracies. So we should see what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in Ukraine as a coordinated action by Moscow supported by China. We should not assume, definitely not with Moscow, but we should not assume that China necessarily uh, wants to bring about peace and stability in the region. All right, uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis, thank you so much for sharing all your insights with us. It's always, always uh, 
you know, anyone watching this interview and hearing your thoughts on this and the questions would gain better perspective on what is going on at the moment and what to expect in the days and weeks to come, which are going to be very, very crucial for the entire world because West Asia is, the ripples of that are going to be felt all over. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights. That was Dr. Malcolm Davis joining us from Canberra. Thank you.